Thank you, Bob. I gave you greetings from the Sunshine State of Florida, where yesterday, believe it or not, I was laying by a pool in a balmy 76 degrees with a clear sky, not trying to torture you. I'm just, it's amazing to see white stuff outside my window this morning that I'm not used to uh, in this month, of course. But uh, thank you for being here. Pastors are like the mayors of small cities, tremendously busy. Some of you are like the governors of small states, depending upon the size of your church. But we are so grateful for you to be here. Our society mocks you. The media reviles you. Hollywood paints you as a hypocrite, but nothing could be further from the truth. No one sees the hours upon hours of painful weeping, holding couples together, counseling, caring, studying. The veneer of our culture is so thin. What holds it together is like this thin membrane. And I really believe with all my heart that the church is this wonderful preserving influence that but for its existence, there would be a collapse in the social order of such profound proportions that it would be stunning. What you do is amazingly important and don't let anyone ever uh, minimize your importance of what you do. We appreciate you on behalf of the entire team. Well, my uh, goal here, can you give me that clicker please? Right there. My goal here is to talk to you today about the law and the IRS um, and what you can and can't do. There's actually more that you can do. There's only a couple things that you can do and I'll show you this very clear. But I want to free you from all anxiety, from all fear of any engagement. Uh, and that is my goal to do that uh, this afternoon. Now there's three primary reasons I, as I have talked to thousands of pastors in Florida and around the country as to why pastors are reluctant in engaging the process and reluctant in leading their people to be good citizens and to be policy advocates and perhaps even engage in the political process. First is theological and philosophical. Now if you sat here this entire couple of days and you don't get philosophically and theologically and historically why you should be engaged, well, I can't help you because you have received the finest apologetic that I am aware of in this country as to why it's important and why we should both biblically, historically, and every other way engage the culture. Secondly is internal church politics, okay? This is the deacons that won't deke. This is the elders. This is the ladies with blue hair that have lots of money and tithe faithfully and say, Pastor, don't get too close. Well, gentlemen and ladies, uh, with all due respect, what I would say to you in, that, in this category is we must fear God and not fear man. That is our primary calling is to fear God. That is the beginning of wisdom, not looking at the bottom line and who's going to leave the church and be upset. And if you have that problem, you have three options lovingly teach and instruct and walk your congregation through the apologetic why it's important. Two, kindly and faithfully ask that person to leave. Or three, leave yourself. It's that important and start another church and build from the ground up. It's that important. Our country depends upon it. And then the final reason is legal reasons. And that's what I'm going to spend most of my time here developing. There's a critical distinction between the tax-exempt status and the tax-exempt letter ruling. The tax exempt status is with you and will always be with you from the beginning of the republic. When you get in a living room and you say, we're going to meet as a church and you start organizing and acting like a church, you are tax exempt from that moment on. You do not need a letter from the IRS. It's always been that way. Now, the letter ruling is something that you have to apply for. It's not automatic. Now, why do people get it? Uh, and, and by the way, this does not apply to nonprofits like my own, the Florida Family Policy Council, uh, 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 family leader, the group here in Iowa. You all have to apply for and be granted a letter. Only churches are automatically tax exempt. <clears throat> so, why do you get one? Well, some people get it just because of convenience. Because if you're going to buy a large product and it's going to have sale tax and you want it waived, you can show them the certificate and they'll waive the taxes. If one of your members in your congregation gets audited on a charitable contribution audit, which I was three years ago, they're going to ask us to tell all the documentation about these C3s. Well, you know what? If you don't want to get one, you can just talk to Chuck Hurley or myself or someone else, and you can get a nice letter explaining why churches are automatically tax exempt and that you are a church and that you fit the model. And it will do just as well as a certificate. Jerry Falwell, Thomas Road Baptist, he never got one and still doesn't have one to this day and never will because why? He doesn't need one. It's just for convenience sake. Now, hypothetically, 
uh, let's say you did get a letter and you lose the letter, you cross the line. What happens? Well, you can cure the violation and everything's fine, or you just apply and get another one. Change one word in your name as a corporation and you can get another one. It's just that simple. Okay? It's just that simple. <clears throat> now, there's three types of activities. I want you to think about three categories of activity in this whole discussion. And by the way, on your tables are a transcript of pretty much everything that I'm saying today, in addition to a checklist by Max Staber with Liberty Council that goes over some of the hypotheticals, so you can take a look at that. The first category is education. What is education? Well, education is preaching and teaching on anything, citizenship, importance of being registered to vote, of course, doctrine, Christian life, marriage, family, the things you normally preach on the scripture. But I'm just saying the outer edge is what the Bible has to say on any moral, social, and political issue, you name it, abortion, government's role, Islam, euthanasia, evolution, taxes, elder care, any issue you can think of, you can preach about, teach about, and talk about in an unlimited way. There is no limitation on education whatsoever. In a sense, this is the reason you exist, to educate your members. Now, the second category is lobbying. Lobbying is defined as the influencing of the outcome of a legislation. Whenever you say to somebody, vote yes or vote no, call your legislator and tell them to vote yes or no, that's lobbying. What is legislation? Well, any federal, state, or local referendum, initiative, or constitutional amendment. When, by God's grace, your legislature passes out the marriage amendment bill twice, that campaign will be a form of lobbying. Now, are there any limitations on lobbying? Yes, in a sense, but really, it's, it's illusory. It's an illusory limitation, I'll show you why. Churches are supposedly only able to do an insubstantial amount of lobbying. Well, what does insubstantial mean? Well, there's one revenue ruling that says that less than 5% of the time and effort is considered insubstantial. There's another revenue ruling that says the 16 to 20% of a budget was substantial, and so that went over the line. The general rule is 5 to 15%. Now, what if you preached on marriage and at every single time, at every single Sunday school, and every single time you preached, you said, congregation, vote this way, call your legislator, vote on this, every single Sunday for five years in a row. Guess what? Because of the balancing test, you would never ever exceed 15% of your total gross revenue and all the hours of all the volunteers and paid staffs and funerals and counseling and all that would have to be put together and that would have to exceed 15%. There's no way you would ever do that. And even a man like Dr. James Kennedy, who practically talked about these issues every time he entered the pulpit, never even came close to violating the, the lobbying uh, uh, restriction. So it's a limitation, but it's illusory, because really, you could, you could lobby all day long, but since you have so many other things you're doing, there's no way you would ever uh, exceed the balancing test realistically. Now, the final category, and this is the only real hard and fast rule, it's, and there's two very simple ones, is that churches are prohibited, in addition to all the nonprofits, from attempting to influence the outcome of an election. 